I don't hate saying you were right, but every single thing you, you've pretty much talked about on the show for the last six months that you've been joining us has come to fruition here uh, it, regarding the war in Ukraine. I mean, while the New York Times spent the weekend uh, virtue signaling about maybe we should have some concerns about Nazi-related patches on Ukrainian soldiers' Weird. Uh, <laughs> body armors, you were talking about failed spring offensives and not much happening going on with the summer one. It seems that is exactly where we're at right now. You were talking about blown up ammunition dumps last time. A week after you were on our show, we started seeing it trickle into the mainstream media, and we're coming back to talk to you today about the absolute latest. What can you tell us? Well, over the last three days, there have been what people are now calling probing attacks against Russian defenses. Things haven't turned out well for the Ukrainians. The, the Russians have had 210 wounded, 71 killed. The Ukrainians have lost nearly 4,000 people. 54 tanks, 210 armored fighting vehicles, 134 trucks, uh, four or five aircraft, in other words, fixed wing jet fighters and uh, two helicopters. That's a pretty, those are pretty costly probing attacks if you're trying to find a weak point in the Russian defenses. Now, of course, we have the dam over the Dnieper River. Yep. That appears to have had an explosion uh, break the dam. And it looks like the explosion was from within the dam itself. So weird. And increasingly, it looks like one of the turbines, you know, the major engines that are powered by the water blew up. Now, whether or not that was done purposely by the Ukrainians or anybody else, I mean, Ukrainians obviously blame everything on the Russians. If the sun comes up two minutes late tomorrow morning, the Russians obviously held it back. <laughs> but uh, bottom line is, uh, you know, the the broken dam has actually made matters worse for the Ukrainians. Uh, they have uh, flooded many of the areas on the eastern side of the Dnieper where the Russians were defending. This actually makes the whole defense easier because you have a 900-mile defensive line. Now apparently 20, 30 miles of that has been uh, eliminated because of the flooding. And again, it's going to have a terrible impact on the city of Kherson. It's going to be flooded. Uh, there's no good news for Ukraine. And, and now I, I guess we have to wait for the major offensive because I have a feeling that the dam breaking the way it has is the sort of signal for this big offensive to start. Now, Colonel, I've seen quite a few uh, accounts on, on Twitter that have shown some videos released by uh Russian state media showing just what you said, some of those probing attacks, the armored personnel carriers, the tanks getting absolutely destroyed where they're, where they're coming through and trying to test Russian defense lines. In addition to that, you, you, you have to talk about some of the other things that are, that are going on here uh, with Vladimir Zelensky. I, I've noticed that a, a narrative kind of building in the background. Um, there was an article that came out, I believe it was in the New York Times like two weeks ago, saying that if this guy, and, and I'm paraphrasing now because the New York Times obviously lies about it a whole lot better than I'm going to say it, but if he doesn't get his shit together in the next six months, he could be the same kind of victim that we saw back in 2014 during the color revolution there in Ukraine. Essentially, they would you know, figure out a way to get rid of him because they know he's not going to be the guy to get us out of this mess. Do you see something like that coming down the pike for, for Zelensky even after? I mean, a lot of people are starting to question where all this money is going. You have Ukraine complaining all weekend that they don't have enough air defenses, even though they're getting the long-range missiles and, and, and the jets now to, to support them. So, what do you think? Uh, I think the following. Uh, Zelensky has always been Washington's puppet. Mm -hmm. And the puppet has uh, rapidly become a serious liability. He's certainly no asset. If anything, his interference with the conduct of military operations has actually worsened Ukraine's position. Uh, so I think that's clear. Secondly, there are articles floating around now about a supposedly frozen conflict. And it's written by people uh, who are neocons or globalists. In other words, you're hearing from within the camp that wants this war with Ukraine. Now start to talk about a, a Korea-like solution to the war. That somehow or another Ukraine is divided and then the two armed camps sit across from each other. Now, if you wanted tangible evidence for the imminent failure of Ukraine and its military establishment, that's it. Because just a few weeks ago, it was glory to Ukraine. Victory is inevitable. The Russians are failing. And oh, by the way, they're still running out of missiles in case you hadn't heard, even though more missiles landed all over Ukraine last night. So the, the, the bottom line is, 
things have gone very badly. You know, we're down to probably 18 to 20 million people left in Ukraine. Uh, they're they're running out of bodies to put into uniform. They brought back the 30 to 35,000 Ukrainian soldiers training in Germany, the Czech Republic, Canada, the United States. They're the ones that they're going to try and make the backbone for this uh, counteroffensive. And the Russians, of course, are, are could not be happier because the last several months sitting behind their defenses, they've annihilated probably 100,000 Ukrainians. Uh, we're looking at a, a death toll in Ukraine of somewhere between 300 and 350,000 at this point. Yeah. Russian deaths, perhaps 35,000. So this is not a war of attrition unless the attrition is all on the Ukrainian side. So I think, I, I think this thing is coming to some sort of conclusion this summer. The question is, what's it going to look like? And you know, Washington, no one in Washington could admit that they made a terrible mistake. So I think I think we're seeing the Ukrainians bash themselves to pieces one more time. Then the Russian forces are going to move, and then it's a question of what uh, what does Moscow want to do, and how far will it go? And thus far, the, the Moscow has been very cautious, and I think they've been cautious because they don't want to give Washington an, an excuse to try and intervene in Western Ukraine, right? And they certainly don't want to precipitate a nuclear confrontation. No. So, so instead of sort of sledgehammer style blasting everything at once and moving 300,000 soldiers into the attack, they've moved incrementally. I think we'll now see a more deliberate attack, captures more ground. They want Odessa. They want Kharkov. They'll probably overrun the rest of eastern Ukraine. And then I think there'll be a pause. And all we can do at this stage is hope that the Europeans – Change some governments. You know, Schultz is now about as popular as the Black Plague in Germany. <laughs> he's de- he's dis- he's deindustrialized his country. Cheap energy is the lifeblood of modern scientific industrial power and civilization. He's cut it off, and the Germans have had it. He he gave us tried to give a speech yesterday. I watched it uh, on live stream, and uh, he was booed off the stage. He couldn't get a word out. He kept saying. We are trying to fight Russia. We are fighting Russia. And it's, woo, you know, forget it. You know, we've heard that before. Uh, the Russians aren't coming. They're not going to attack Western Europe. They're not going to attack Poland. They're not going to attack anybody except the Ukrainians. Yep. They know it. And they, they've, they've kind of run out of time to push this narrative. Colonel, how big of a, now you talk about R- Russian holding their defenses and, and Ukraine basically losing so many troops along the way here. How large of a component has the Wagner Group been in, in making sure that Russia meets some of those uh, logistical benchmarks that they set out to at the beginning of this special operation or conflict right now? And and what do you think their role is moving forward as you – as basically we all assume now they're going to continue to push a little bit east? The Wagner Group should be viewed by people not as mercenaries – but is essentially the Russian equivalent of a foreign legion. Uh, and during World War II, the foreign legion, which numbers in peacetime, 25, 30,000 max, went up to over 100,000. Uh, the Wagner Group was expanded and now numbers uh, somewhere between 50 and 60,000. That probably also includes some reinforcement from the Russian army's artillery and tanks and so forth. They have performed brilliantly. There's no question about it, just as the French Foreign Legion always performs brilliantly. There are a large number of Serbs. There are even some Germans. Yep. There, there are different kinds of people fighting inside the Wagner organization. So it really is a, a professional force like the French Foreign Legion. They are going to get a rest now, I suspect. And I, I imagine they'll be used against uh, tough, tough nuts that have to be cracked. You know, perhaps when they go into uh, Odessa, you know, to clear the city quickly, they may use Wagner. Uh, if they want to s- take control of some critical bridge sites, they may use Wagner. But the bulk of the Russian military, the army, hasn't really seen that much action. Right. They're ready. They are ready. They have pristine equipment. They're well trained. They're ready to be unleashed. So. Putin has got to make some decisions here, and I think they'll be made once it's clear that the Ukrainians are exhausted completely. Then I think they'll move. But again, he has never wanted to destroy Ukraine. Right. And secondly, he doesn't want to rule Ukraine. 
His preeminent concern was always the Russian part of the country, which is what he largely controls at this stage. The Russians there were being oppressed. They were third or fourth class citizens. They were told either Ukrainianize and abandon your Russian identity, language, culture, religion, or get out of the country. And many of them were being killed. Remember, there were 14,000 people killed in the eight years that preceded the outbreak of this conflict in February last year. And of those, 12,000 plus were Russians living in Luhansk and Donetsk, which are Russian areas. Yep. So, so the bottom line is he's, he's largely accomplished that. And the question is, what are the Europeans going to do? Well, if the Germans wake up and get smart, and certainly the Germans are intelligent people to get rid of Schultz, one would hope that uh, Macron would be sent packing by the French. If those kinds of things were to happen, I'm sure Putin would talk to new governments. The problem for Putin is why should he talk to us? Why should he talk to Macron or Schultz? They've lied before. Yep. Yeah, they have the, uh, you know, basically the, the League of African Nations looking to get them to the negotiation tables. But that's kind of w- with a lot of CCP influence as well. So I, I saw that clip the other day where the, uh, the, the president of South Africa pushed back on the BBC reporter and he was saying like, Hey, Putin's going to come here for some, uh, you know, global summit regarding the economy. You guys going to arrest him when he gets off the plane? They're like, what are you guys, <laughs> what are you guys talking about? They're like, dude, right. you guys killed like six million people in Iraq. And you said there he, he literally said Tony Blair should have rode out of Iraq on a nuclear warhead mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. to the reporter's face. The reporter didn't know where to go with it. He's like, uh, are, are, so you're not going to arrest him? He's like, no. <laughs> He's like, you guys need to just figure this out. That's the problem. All of these leaders, they don't want to do anything except look like they're doing the right thing. They've been absolutely doing the wrong thing. The people are starting to wake up, and we're going to hopefully start seeing some accountability at the ballot box everywhere from, like you said, France and Germany. We've already seen it a little bit in Italy and then over to the United States next year. Colonel, this has been awesome sitting down with you today. Of course, we're going to look to have you back at some time, hopefully later in the month on our show. We're going to live link your website in the show description today. Is there anywhere else you want us to live link that our people could check you out? No, I, I think uh, that's fine. Uh, you know, there's there's plenty of videos on YouTube that cover everything that we've discussed and that I've discussed in the past. I just hope the American people are going to pay very close attention finally because our problems here at home are infinitely worse than they were just six months ago. And this war makes no sense. It's not only a waste of money, it's a drain on our our economic strength. It's a drain on our lifeblood because this country has no interest in going to war right now with anybody except maybe Mexico and the drug cartels. I could certainly make a case for that uh, after we close the border. But right now, there's no reason for any of this nonsense to go on. No.